It's great. Right. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the Working for a Wild New York site uh, talk as part of One Planet Week here at the, the University of York. Um, so today we've got Alistair Fitter, um, an ecologist at the University of York and fellow of the uh, Royal Society. So he's also a representative and speaker of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. So we've got a lovely talk here today. Um, and if anyone has any questions, um, we've got the Q&A functionality enabled. Um, so if you put your questions in there and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so yeah, and if you see any questions similar to ones that you'd like answered, uh, just use the thumbs up button um, instead of posting a duplicate question. Um, um, and then we'll get some at the end. That's great. Well, I'll uh, pass you over to Alistair. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to tell you about the work of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. Um, and I've called it working for a wild Yorkshire because that is it, that is precisely what the Trust is dedicated to trying to achieve, uh, to reversing the decline in wildlife in Yorkshire and to actually um, moving it to a more positive state. Uh, and this talks about what the trust does. Um, and for some reason, my screen won't move on. It does has now. OK, so if you travel a couple of miles west of York along the uh, road to Leeds, and then you go along a small ridge, and uh, that's that's the same moraine that the university is on. So the, the, the library and the water tower and all the rest of it are on a, that what in York counts for a hill. That's a glacial moraine left behind 17,000 years ago by the last ice age. And it continues west towards Tadcaster. And just below that ridge, there lies a wet and swampy area, a bog. It's, it's an extraordinary place. Uh, it's called Ascombe Bog. And it is home to uh, between 5 and 10% of all the wildlife in Britain even though it's only 46 hectares. Uh, it's a complete jewel in the Yorkshire crown. It's probably the richest place for wildlife in Yorkshire for its size. Um, and it is uh, freely open. You can go and walk around and you will see wonderful things. You will see if you go at the right time of year, uh, of the 400 species of plants recorded there, you may see this one, which is water violet, um, an absolutely glorious thing that grows in the ditches that surround and cross the bog. Uh, if you're fortunate, fortunate uh, and go to the right place, you may see the royal ferns, Yorkshire's answer to the tree fern, the biggest of which are three and a half metres tall, which is uh, quite, a, this is not the biggest one, but this is just an easier one to photograph, um, and are probably the oldest living things in York. And there's a wonderful history behind them as to why they're, um, they're, they're there and why they're so ancient, which I won't go into today. Um, there are over 800 species of moth recorded, uh, which is a third of all British moths. So this is an extraordinarily rich place. And there are some wonderful birds. So willow tits occur there, and that's one of Britain's, Britain's fastest declining birds. So this is a rich and important place. And it was renowned from the 19th century onwards as a wonderful place for natural history. And in the Second World War, it came on the market because it had been bought by a timber merchant, uh, who, because at the time it was quite heavily wooded, and he thought he would extract the, um, the, the timber. And the story goes that he took a tractor on, after having chopped lots of trees down, and the tractor never came off. We haven't yet found it, but it's presumably deep, deep buried in the peat there somewhere. Uh, it came on the market and it was bought by two iconic York names, Arnold Rowntree and Francis Terry, who are, uh, you know, the scions of the chocolate dynasties in York. And they put, they bought it and they gave it to what was then called the Yorkshire Naturalist Trust as its first reserve. In fact, the Yorkshire Naturalist Trust was created to receive Ascombe Bog as a gift. Uh, so this is where the, what is now called the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust was born. And at that time, it had one reserve. It had a very small number of members, uh, but they were some of them were well-known names in Yorkshire. It was it was it was given a good send-off, as it were. Uh, so the trust is now seventy-five years old, a bit over, um, and is uh, extremely successful. And it's in, and it's an important organisation because it's 
uh, the only organization in Yorkshire which is devoted to the wildlife of Yorkshire as a whole. It now has 150 staff, and there's most of them at a staff away day. Last year, that was, I think. Um, and they're obviously all exhibitionists. Um, it has over 800 volunteers, and it's one of it's a part of a national movement. There are 46 county or sometimes national wildlife trusts in in the in the UK. So Scotland has one, um, but then yeah, in fact Yorkshire has three because it's bits of Teesside and bit, and there's one for Sheffield and Rotherham that are both in Yorkshire. But nevertheless, we we do cover the whole of Yorkshire. Currently, it's 46,500 members. Uh, we need to in increase that, so please join if you if you would like to support the work of the Trust. So it's, it's now a big and very professional organisation, having been a rather uh, small and um, almost entirely volunteer-run organisation at one time. Now, you're probably familiar with the, 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 the term state of nature, because it, which comes from a, a report that is issued about every five years. All the national conservation bodies, people like the RSPB, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trusts and others get together and they do an analysis of what is happening to wildlife. And the most recent one come, came, I mean, here are just some headline statistics from it. I mean, there are lots of other pretty alarming things in it that 68% of wildlife populations have declined in the last 50 years. Uh, that's a huge, I mean, most wildlife populations are in decline. Uh, that's very worrying. And in fact, of the species that could be surveyed for assessment, 15 of those, 15% of those are now threatened with extinction. So clearly there is a, there is a real problem. Uh, we are losing wildlife and we're losing habitats for wildlife, despite the incredible extraordinary efforts of many many conservation bodies to try to protect it so that's as the situation but of course it's not the end of it because there are new threats uh, all the time and the most recent threat of well, the, the one that's becoming center stage now of course is climate change this uh, I'm sorry the caption has disappeared off the bottom this is Huxtowell Marsh which is part of the Potterick Car Nature Reserve this was last August it should be wet and of course last August we had an exceptional drought so climate change is an increasing threat to wildlife it's also an opportunity for wildlife because we have species spreading north which we've never seen before and indeed on this very site uh, the first pair of black wing stilts, it's a very rare raid, wading bird ever to, well, not the first pair to breed in Britain, but by far the furthest north pair ever to breed in Britain uh, occurred here. They, they've occasionally bred in the south of England before, but this is by far the furthest north they've bred. And so th there are opportunities with climate change, but there are also very severe threats. But we do, as well as threats, have allies. And this chap, you probably recognize, he came and visited Askenbog, the birthplace of the Wildlife Trust, as part of our 70th birthday celebrations in 2016. And uh, he, he gave us a rather um, wonderful quote. At the time, there was a very severe threat to Askenbog. The, a, a, a housing development company wanted to build a thousand houses bang next door to it and the consequence of that would have been that it would have dried out and the wildlife the biodiversity would have been lost and it's not that we don't need houses of course we do but we need them in the right places and building them next to a jewel of the natural world such as this was a really silly idea David Attenborough gave us this wonderful quote. He said, building houses next to Ascombe Bog would be like building a Tesco next to York Minster. And you can imagine the outcry if anybody suggested that. And in fact, York Minster and Ascombe Bog are equally part of York's heritage. Uh, one is more prominent, but Ascombe has been there for longer than York Minster and in many ways is as important. And I think, it, and it actually that was shown because when the actual application for house building came in 7,000 people wrote to the city of York council to object and they had never ever had anything remotely like that I mean normally very contentious proposals get a few hundred objections and yet 7,000 people chose to object 
to this development. And I think that is, that is an incredibly hopeful thing. It means that people are, are recognizing the important place that these, these wild places hold in society and in our, in our culture. And I, that gives me hope that we will actually uh, be, come out and succeed in the battle to save wildlife. But it is, it is a, a severe battle at the moment. So what does the Wildlife Trust do? Well, it basically does three things. It manages nature reserves, and those are hugely important. And they're the things that most people see uh, because they're, they're there, you can walk around them, you can see wildlife there and so on. It also runs bigger projects, and I'll talk a bit about those too, which, which are important, and I'll, I'll explain why they're important in a moment. And then it does a lot of engagement work, because if we are to succeed in, uh, in, in improving the wildness of Yorkshire, then people have to want it to, to happen. You can't, it's no point a small organization saying this must happen, because it won't. It will only happen if people genuinely want it to. And the, the story of Ascombe Bog and the appeal in the 7th thousand objectors actually shows that people do want that you just have to mobilize them and engage with them so that those are the three things we do and I'll, I'll briefly go through all those and, and and give an outline of the sort of work we do so let's talk about the reserves there are 111 of them at the moment um and they're scattered over yorkshire this is a map the the little numbers in either green for the north or orange for the east or blue for the west for the south, sorry, for the west, and, and brown for the south of Yorkshire, uh, those those numbers are the hundred. Well, actually, there's an older map. There aren't quite. If you if you're looking very carefully, you won't find number 111 on there. But there are now 111 reserves, and that's fantastic. It's also a huge amount of work because they nearly all need managing in one way or another. Many of these sites are really quite small, and small reserves can't really be left to themselves. They need to be looked after to, to ensure that they are protected from damage, from pollution, from vandalism, or whatever else it may be. But those 111 reserves, which is a huge workload for a relatively small organisation, cover 0.2% of Yorkshire. So they're clearly not going to do everything we need. Nevertheless, they are enormously important, and I'll show you one or two things about why they're so important. So here are some examples of some of our most famous reserves. So at the top left, you've got Askham Bog over here in winter. Think about Askham, it, A, it's very, it's very accessible. It's just two, three miles from York Minster. There's a bus that goes virtually to the door, um, and it's got a boardwalk. You can walk around, even though it's a bog, and there's a bit of a clue there, it's a bit wet. But the boardwalk means you can walk around it at any time of year. Um, and, and so it's a very accessible reserve. There it is in winter. This is Spurn Point, which was our third reserve in 1956, I think. And it was bought from the MOD. It was in, in, in the war, in the Second World War. It was owned by the Ministry of Defence and they got rid of it. Uh, it is an extraordinary place. I mean, if you have the chance to go to Spurn, you must go there. There is nowhere else like it in the country. It's a great long peninsula of sand stretching way, way down across the mouth of the Humber estuary. There's a lighthouse at the end, which you can go up. And you can't, you used to be able to drive down. There was a military road went down, but the sea has now broken through this peninsula. So it's at high tide, it's now an island. Um, but the trust has safaris. They take you down in an enormous ex-military vehicle, which can get you right to the end. Or you can walk the three or four miles down to the end, which is an amazing experience because you are surrounded by sea on both sides. The Humber Estuary on one side and the North Sea on the other. Extraordinary place. Um, these are places that we have to protect uh, because they, they host a huge amount of wildlife and they need protecting. There are also areas where we not only need to protect, but we need to enhance. So here's a, a classic example. This is now our second largest reserve. Spurn Point is the largest reserve. This one is Potterick Tar, just south of, of, um, of Doncaster. And this one here is uh, old uh, mine workings and railway workings and all sorts of ex-industrial. It was also once a, a proper a wild wetland, but it was impacted by various forms of industrial development. It's now being uh, re encouraged to, to it's, it is allowing being allowed to restore, but encouraged as well to restore na uh, nature to, to encounter. It's now one of the richest places we have. 
um, and, and a big site, and that matters. And then, of course, we also have coastal sites and marine sites, and those are hugely important to it. It's very easy to forget that conservation has to include the marine as well as the land and the fresh water. So that, that full panoply of sorts of sites that we have is hugely important, and we must protect them and we must enhance them. We must ensure that they get better for wildlife and not just stay as they are, because part getting better is part of the uh, getting a wild Yorkshire. But the third thing we actually do is in indeed enhancing existing sites is actually create new ones. So all the time land is being changed in its use. So a very frequent use of land is gravel extraction. And these are two sites. The one at the left here uh, is um, uh, Ripon City Wetlands and the one at the right, I think, is, um, is uh, North Cave Wetlands. These are two ex-gravel pits which have been allowed to recover and are now really important habitats for many bird species. But these aren't just allowed to recover. You can see there's been very careful design here. These sort of these ridges of, 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 uh, of higher land with water between are what you need if you're going to get reed beds, because the reeds grow, so they grow, they establish themselves on these bits of dry land, and then they spread out into the water. And reed beds are essential for a whole range of important bird species like bittern and marsh harrier and so on and so forth, bearded tit, all of which are beginning to re colonize Yorkshire because we're providing the new habitat which wasn't there before. So protection is important, enhancement is important, and creation of new habitat is important as well. So that's another part of the work. And then, of course, all these sites have to be, well, not all of them, but most of these sites have to be managed. Of course, it would be lovely if we could do rewilding, but rewilding requires a lot of land. If you want to allow the land just to go back under its own steam, it has to be big patches. Small patches don't do that well uh, because they don't have the full range of, of, of species needed. So very often we actually have to, uh, to manage them. So here is one of our sites. At the foot on the foot foothills of Ingleborough on the slopes of Ingleborough, and this is actually interesting because this traditionally was sheep grazed, and the sheep grazing was actually quite damaging. It's now cattle grazed with a much a better effect impacts on wildlife. So getting the right management also makes a huge difference. And then there are the marine sites. So the uh, the thing about the marine sites is it's a, it's 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 a boundary. Uh, the sea matters hugely, and we're heavily involved in engaging with, with communities of, 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 of people who fish and so on, commercial fisheries, but also the, 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 land, the land boundary is hugely important too. So these coastal fringes are Im immensely rich, and a site like this, which is our reserve at Flamborough Head, uh, is really important because those cliffs have huge breeding populations of seabirds, but they're only there because there's food in the sea for them. And uh, that is the need to maintain both a healthy sea and a healthy land together. Just as on land, healthy rivers and healthy land go together. Uh, so it's this, this network, these connections, which are so important in making sure you actually do enhance wildlife. So the reserves are hugely important. They are the arcs from which future colonization of the landscape will happen. If we didn't have the reserves, we'd have lost most of this wildlife, it would have gone. Because increasingly, the land between the reserves has less and less wildlife on it. Agriculture has become more and more intensive in the last 50 years with uh, providing less and less space for wildlife. Urbanization has increased hugely providing, again, less space for wildlife. And there's been an enormous amount of infrastructure development. If you want to see that, this is Ascombe Bog. So Ascombe Bog is, is, if you can see my mouse, is this darker area here. It's surrounded by a golf course, by agricultural fields, by two major roads, the York Bypass, and by the East Coast Railway going on here, and then by drink houses up here, and by Cotman Thorpe down here. This is a site which is entirely cut off from the landscape. And that's very dangerous because many species require to be able to move around if they're going to sustain effective populations. It's just about big enough, Askenborg, at 46 hectares, to still have populations of things like willow tit. 
But if it was any smaller, you would lose those. And small sites need to be connected to a better uh, hinterland where they're actually can can, can so so, they, so these reserves are are, the, are arcs where species will survive, but they are not the answer to making a wilder Yorkshire. If we want to make a wilder Yorkshire, then we have to worry about the wider landscape. And that this comes was really powerfully demonstrated by a report that was published about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, led by a, a, this chap here, a Sir John Lawton, who is currently president of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. We're very fortunate. He's an ex-University of York academic, uh, went off to do other things, but has come back to live in York and is president of the Wildlife Trust. And in his report, he came up with this important phrase, more, bigger, better joined. And the argument is that you need more reserves because the reserves are why wildlife thrives best. You need bigger reserves because bigger reserves actually have more wildlife in them. You need better reserves. They need to be well managed. And it, the truth is that many areas which are meant to be managed for wildlife are not in a good state. Um, because the landowners in question are not terribly interested, perhaps, or whatever. And they need critically to be joined up. It needs to be possible for species to move. And this little diagram here indicates that. So you might have a nature reserve called here a core area, and round it you would want a buffer zone of areas where species can thrive. You want corridors connecting those to other areas, and you want to take in new areas, restore areas that, so that wildlife has more places to live. And the corridors can either be just up to me like a hedge, or they can be stepping stones, a little bits of woodland or something, which enable the species to move across. So this is the idea, and that will enable more species, to, and that will enable the, the landscape generally to become more native nature rich and that is the goal so the goal is not just to have wonderful nature reserves critically important though they are but actually well the gap the goal and this is an, an internationally stated goal is called 30 by 30 and and, and translated to yorkshire that means that 30 percent of yorkshire should be being managed in a way that's friendly to wildlife by the year 2030 when this was first stated about five years ago, 2030 seemed quite a long way away. Uh, now it seems alarmingly close and whether we will ever get near there is not obvious. So if this is a, an important but challenging target. The other thing of course is the question, what do you mean by managing a way that's friendly for wildlife? Um, the government believes we're already there because they say the national parks the areas of outstanding national beauty and all the various nature reserves together make up nearly 30% of Britain. And that is true. The problem is that large areas of natural parks and of areas of outstanding natural beauty are actually intensive agriculture and are not friendly for wildlife at all. So that's not gonna work. I mean, the government position is not tenable. We're not anywhere near there. So the critical question is, what do we do about the wider landscape? And that's where the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust projects come in. So the projects uh, are landscape based. They're not just looking at a single patch of land. They're looking at the area around the land. And we have over 50 of those on the go at the moment, which is a, another huge task to maintain those. And I'll just tell you about a couple of them. So one, and perhaps the most dramatic, is the Yorkshire Peat Partnership. This has been funded by, originally, a huge amount of EU money. And the goal is to restore the blanket bogs over huge areas of the Pennines. And it's already been incredibly successful. Large areas have been restored already. Um, getting on for half of the Pennines are now in a, in a, in a good state. So this is, a, 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 on the right, is a blanket bog, which is in a really bad state. You can see that the peat is in, bisected by lots and lots of channels and there are channels running right across it and very obvious straight lines and these straight lines are drainage ditches because for, for many many years the goal has been to drain the uplands because the view was that that would increase their productivity and you'd get more sheep now you're never going to get a lot of sheep on Blanket Bog. I mean, if you really want more sheep, you need to get rid of the Blanket Bog entirely. The problem with that is, A, it's an enormous wildlife habitat, but B, it is a huge store of carbon. Uh, 
It is the largest single store of carbon in Britain. And if we were genuinely to get rid of it, we would make up an appallingly large contribution to global climate change. We're already doing that, of course, because the degradation of all this peat means that peat, which is just a store of carbon, it's just organic matter, it's 40% carbon, is going to go straight back into the atmosphere. All, all the areas where you can see there's no peat, the peat's already been turned back into CO2. So this is seriously bad news. So what they've been doing is blocking up all these drains and encouraging a, 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 a much better growth of peat over huge areas. It's been, it's been a really, really successful program. It involves collaboration with a wide range of landowners, with a wide range of other bodies. For example, water companies own huge areas of uplands, and it's in, absolutely in their interest to stop them degrading, because when you do, when you, for example, burn peat and when you allow it to degrade, what happens is a lot of the organic matter, some of it just turns straight back into CO2 and goes in the atmosphere. Some of it turns into dissolved organic carbon and goes into the water, turns the water brown, and people object to brown water coming out of their taps. So the water companies then have spent large sums of money getting rid of the brown coloration. But actually, what they could do much more helpfully is stop it being brown in the first place. And water that filters naturally through the peat and comes out slowly is not badly tainted in that way. And also, it comes out as a much more reliable supply. So one of the problems we have now is, is serious flooding in the lowlands. And much of that flooding is caused by excessive dra uh, drainage in the uplands. So this is a hugely important project. Another one we have is called Wild Inglebal, where we're trying to stitch together quite a few of the uh, of, of the, the areas around Ingleborough that are being managed and join them up. Well, this is the joining up bit to get a much, much larger area. And one of the things is to try and restore the natural tree line, which would be approaching the summit of Ingleborough if it was allowed to be nat there naturally, at least in some parts, not for the whole, whole mountain, but in some parts we want to see if we can get trees back to where they naturally would be. So Wild Ingleborough is another of these big, big projects. And then here's a good marine project. This is in the Humber Estuary. We're trying to restore both seagrass, which is a hugely important carbon sink. It's the only flowering plant to actually grow in the sea underwater. Um, we're putting that back in. It used to be extensive seagrass in the Humber Estuary. It was mostly all gone. And there used to be oysters. Uh, in quantity, there used to be huge oyster beds in, in the Humber Estuary. And the amazing thing about oysters is they're natural water filters. They, they, a single oyster filters 200 litres of water a day, and it actually gets all the, the particles out and you get cleaner water. So one of the goals is to actually bring back both oysters and seagrass, and that means actually manually putting it in. And here are three, three uh, people actually planting seagrass in the Humber Estuary. Uh, I hope, hope the mud is not too quick at that point anyway. Um, so the projects are enormously important. But as I said at the beginning, none of this will work if we don't get people on side. And so a third and a hugely important strand of the Wildlife Trust work is engaging with people and with communities. And that can be by running project, by running uh, uh, events for children, for example, and rock pooling is always a popular one of those. It can be formal education. So we do things for schools, school parties. Uh, and here they are at the Living Seas Centre at Flamborough as a, a school group uh, with lots of volunteers and staff helping them have a, a fantastic day out and actually learning about wildlife and, and the importance of wildlife. Uh, we try to get communities involved in a major way. I mean, this could be something as simple as litter picking, but, but, it, but that has an enormous impact. Once you actually make it look as... Oh, sorry, areas in, in cities are cared for, people start caring for them. It's, a, it, it's, it's very easy to feel that there's no point because it's clearly a derelict area. And we have this amazing program, a national program called Team Wilder. And this actually has as its goal, it's really ambitious, to get one person in four nationally, and therefore, of course, in Yorkshire as well, engaged with wildlife in some way or other. That's a, it's a tall ask. Um, and if we can achieve that, it will have an enormous impact on getting uh, in making it possible to do the core work, which is to restore wildlife. Uh, to that end, we have, a, I said at the beginning, we have over 800 volunteers and they do a huge range of different pro uh, things, 
It may, it may be actual practical work on the ground, uh, or it may be uh, desk work. Uh, uh, look quite a lot of that. We have finance volunteers, all sorts of people doing uh, things which keep the thing. If you think about it, I, I think last year it was something like um, 100,000 hours or something like that, or of course it would be much more. Anyway, I can't remember what the number is. It's an enormous number of hours. It would cost millions to employ the people uh, who volunteer for us. So they are, they are hugely important. Here, here are two volunteers checking the Exmoor ponies. That, uh, and we have a lot of wildlife. It's scattered around the country, a lot of grazing stock scattered around the country. It has to be checked on a daily basis. You can't just have uh, livestock uh, and not look, not look after it. So we have volunteers because we don't have enough staff to do that on a daily basis. The volunteers enable us to do that. Without the volunteers, we couldn't do that. And we have this remarkable thing called the Great Yorkshire Creature Count. You, you've heard of the big bird count, and, you know, garden bird count and butterfly watch and so on. Well, this that's just a, that's just for one type of thing. Here we ask people in Yorkshire to just record every bit of wildlife they see. And we get an amazingly strong response from that. Um, I mean, it may be one day which will be good enough to be, be able to use it as a sort of recording thing or we'll actually get useful data out of it. But at the moment, it's an engagement tool. It enables us to actually talk to people about the exciting things they can see in Yorkshire and interact with people. And, we, and we're hoping to, uh, to extend that to a school programme as well in the very near future. So, uh, uh, so the, the, the creature count is one of the things. 30 Days Wild is another National Wildlife Trust activity where we ask people in June to do something every day. Something wild, what it is, one wildlife related thing a day, again, has an amazing pickup. It's extraordinary how many people uh, sign up to that and actually do it, which is wonderful. Uh, we have a, 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 a youth program for younger children called uh, Wildlife Watch, which is very, very successful. Uh, and of course, we have membership and membership is enormously important because uh, members give us money. Um, but more important than members giving us money is that members give us clout. So if you can say there are 50,000 people in your organization and they all think that something should happen, then politicians begin to take notice. If we could say we had 100,000 people, they'd take even more notice. So if you haven't joined up and think it'd be a good idea, please do so and persuade friends to do so as well. It's a great organization. I've been a member for, well, I won't say how long, uh, okay, over 50 years. Um, and uh, I think uh, I've, I've, I've always found it a fantastic organization to, to be part of. So I'll finish as I started with David Attenborough, who is president of the Wildlife Trust and an enormous ally. And this is a, a quote that uh, he's made uh, some time ago. Um, and he's right. It is in trouble um, and it does need our help. And it's uh, we're the ones who caused the damage and we have it in our power to make it better again and to actually make it better for ourselves, because without wildlife, the world we live in will become dangerously unstable. Uh, and that is a problem. That will be a serious problem for us. I, could, you know, I won't go into the details of that, but it is a big problem. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want to get find out more about the Wildlife Trust, there are lots of links there. Um, and if you have questions, I should be delighted to answer them. Thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk, Alistair. I feel so much more connected to, to Yorkshire as a, as a result of that. Um, in terms of questions, then, if you'd like to ask a question, um, do feel free to post it in the chat. Or if you prefer, put your hand up using the reactions bar at the, at the bottom. You can press raise hand and we'll take um, questions in that order. Just a reminder that the um, talk and the Q&A is being recorded. So if you'd like to contribute and ask your question, but you would like to be edited out, please just say that um, as you begin to ask your question and we can organise that um, to happen. So yeah, who would like to, to get us started then? We currently don't have any questions, but there is, if anyone's struggling to find it, if you uh, click the Q&A button um, at the bottom, it is separate to the chat. Um, and you can ask questions there. Uh, you can post them uh, in the chat. They'll come directly to us. 
Um, we do have um, a first question, which is, um, do you work with other trusts? Uh, absolutely, yeah. The Wildlife Trust nationally is a really powerful movement. Um, it actually um, has uh, nearly a million members. Um, it looks after more uh, land than RSPB, for example. I mean, it's, it's a big, big national movement. Um, it doesn't get the same because it's a federal movement uh, and the focus is often on the individual county trusts. It doesn't quite get the same uh, coverage as it were nationally as, it, as I think it should, but, it, but the trusts all do work closely together. Uh, they, you know, their chief executives and the chairs of their boards all meet uh, on a regular basis. There are lots of working groups where they work, you know, get together for, with other other groups, other trusts, and talk, you know, think about strategy and so on and so forth. So yeah, and particularly with neighbouring trusts, because wildlife, for strange reasons, pays no attention to administrative boundaries. So we do have to worry about the wildlife that crosses the boundaries in places like Yorkshire over to Lincolnshire, Yorkshire over to Derbyshire, Yorkshire over to Lancashire. So, so we have very particularly close relationships with our neighbouring trusts. But yeah, so yes, we do. Thanks. Um, a second question um, from, from Vicky is, how do you persuade our government that their reckoning of the area, including national parks, is big enough to do something about this? Sorry, how do we persuade them that? Uh, how do you persuade our government that their reckoning of the area, including national parks, is big enough to do something about this? Um, I think it's very difficult. A uh, government want, wants a particular answer on this. It wants to be able to say, well, there's no problem, we've done it. Um, but there is a lot, I mean, the answer is uh, that we do it by collaboration with all the other national conservation bodies. There was a, a huge outcry earlier this year, uh, sorry, at the end of last year, when um, the, the short-lived trust government uh, said it was uh, threatened to dump the policy by which farmers would be rewarded in subsidies for public good rather than for uh, production. Or, or in, as, as the current system is, the one we've inherited from the common agricultural policy, which is just for having farmland. So at the moment, you, uh, in, the, in the recent past, farms have just been given subsidies if they have farmland. But uh, the, the proposal has been for the last five years a thing called ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Strategy, uh, which was meant to ensure that farmers got subsidies if they were doing things which were for public good, which largely meant for biodiversity, uh, against climate change, and so on and so forth. The trust government threatened to just drop that. There was an enormous outcry, and the National Trust, the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, and all the other big uh, conservation bodies got together. Unusual for them to actually uh, uh, mobilize themselves that quickly. And the government very quickly backed down. Well, actually, the government disappeared, actually, but <laughs> it was in the process of backing down before it disappeared. Um, and so I think the answer is if, if the National Trust, with whatever it is, four million members or something, and the RSBB with whatever it is, two million members, and the Wildlife Trust with whatever it is, a million members, you know. If all those organizations, which collectively probably represent five, six, seven million people, uh, all come on the warpath and say, what you're doing is absolutely appalling, then governments do depend upon votes uh, from time to time, and they are gonna worry about that. So the answer is public pressure, and it, therefore it really matters how many people are signed up to these organizations? The bigger the membership, uh, you don't need to join the National Trust. They've got masses of members. What you need to join is one of the wildlife trusts because they need more. We've only got a million members and that's not nearly enough. So join, we need to double that. We need 2 million members, please. So join up and get all your friends to join up. But that's where the pressure comes from. It's from governments knowing that there are huge numbers of people out there. Thank you very much. And I was just trying to to There's some in the Q and A I've got in front of me. Shall I shall I look at those? Um, yes. Um, so I think we're on Marie's question about how near or far we are to achieve the thirty by twenty thirty goal. Yeah, I'm looking at different ones, but it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll listen to you. Uh, how how close are we? In truth, you mean as opposed to using the, the national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty, uh, miles away. 
Um, we, uh, you, you know, the, the, you, I suppose you can get a clue from the fact that the 111 Yorkshire Wildlife Trust reserves make up 0.2% of Yorkshire. I think it's generally held that the land managed properly for wildlife is somewhere in the 5 to 10% range. range. I mean, in truth, we're not going to get to 30% in nature reserves, and nor do we need to. What matters is that large numbers of landowners, and there are many who are deeply sympathetic to this. There are, there are actually large numbers of farmers who are deeply sympathetic to this goal. If, if we can persuade those people and if the systems that are, incentivize those people to operate in a different way, then we will achieve it. But it requires that. That is, that is the key to this. That we need to we need to incentivize people to do what they actually want to do lots of farmers genuinely want to farm in a different way they've been driven down the intensive farming route by this the economic system that's been constructed for farming and many of them hate it actually thanks very much um so there are a couple of questions around Ask and Bog particularly, so um, whether or not the application for housing um, has been refused and if it's protect permanently protected from development on the adjacent land now. Um, so, yeah, so do you want to take those ones and then yep. we'll move so, on to the So the answer is it was refused. Um, it was refused by the City Council in 2019. Um, and then the developers appealed, it went to a public inquiry, and to, I think, most people's astonishment, we won the public inquiry, and I actually really have to hand it to the City Council, because normally, when a, a developer appeals against a council planning decision, the council gives in, because they're frightened that they'll be made to pay costs if they lose on the appeal. But the City Council, bless them, stood their ground. The Wildlife Trust was a co-defendant of that. We made an appeal and we raised £45,000 from the good people of York and Yorkshire, um, which enabled us to pay for expert advice. And we did win that. And that's unusual. It's not very common for developers to lose appeals. So the, I, I, can, I can wax lyrical about how the way in which the system is rigged in favour of the developers. Uh, I won't weary you with it now, but it was. Um, and the, I mean, the developers had a QC, as it then was. Um, we we were represented by two pro bono um, barristers who were young trainees. They were really good, but they weren't QCs. And I, I was one of the expert witnesses. And I can tell you that being grilled by a QC is one of those life experiences you only want to do once. Um, so yes, we did win. It's now in the New York local plan. The area is recognised as green belt which gives it some protection, but it's not absolute protection. And I would rather it was in some form of absolute protection. Can I just ask a quick follow up to the kind of success of, of that process that um, what could um, others learn for in terms of how to win um, something like that? What do you think made that successful when the kind of history suggests that it wouldn't be? I think one of the critical things there was we had made a big effort over the years to make the bog accessible. So there is this wonderful boardwalk which goes around it. Uh, and so lots of people, I mean, we, we had a counter up there. And the year before the appeal, before the application, uh, we recorded nearly 30,000 visits. Now, a lot of those are people who go every day, you know, understand that, but still there's a very large number of people going around the bog and enjoying it. And I think it is that ability to connect with wildlife and with wild places that matters. If you, if you take a very old fashioned and traditional view of conservation and you say people are a problem, you should keep them off from these areas, then when your site is threatened, it's very unlikely that many people are going to feel, well, I must, I must protest because they, it, won't, it won't affect them greatly. So I think this is where the engagement is so important. If people actually are, are sort of allowed to connect with nature, then when it is threatened, they will support you. So I think that's the single biggest lesson. Oh, the other thing is actually having experts. Uh, and we had a brilliant hydrogeologist who was absolutely fantastic. We had to pay for that, uh, but he was superb. So you have to have your science right. So the science matters hugely, but but also uh, the public engagement matters. Thanks. Um, so moving away from Askham Bog now, um, what's happening with plans, the original plans for a Great North Forest, uh, Martin Zasker? 
that's going ahead um and there are patches of woodland being planted all over the place um i i think my, my problem with things like the great north forest is not that they're not i don't like planting trees i'm very happy to see trees planted my problem is that very little thought is usually given to the right places to put trees and the right way to manage the trees after they've been planted and that matters far more than planting trees uh planting trees is 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 fine though personally um my view is that trees have been planting themselves with enormous success for about uh 350 million years and they're quite good at just doing it and you don't have to plant trees you can just manage the land in a way that is tree friendly but we have an obsession now with planting trees so everybody has to go out there with large plastic tubes and stick them in the ground and put trees in them um and quite often what you grow is lots of large plastic tubes uh, but nevertheless if it's successful that's fine um but personally i would not do it that way but if it's being done that way i'll buy that but i am concerned with where trees are put and with it being a strategic thing where you actually identify places where having woodland will be most beneficial and least harmful because sometimes people plant them in places that are harmful if you plant them on species rich grassland for example that's a really un un unhelpful thing to do um and also what you do with them afterwards so you how do you manage this woodland to ensure that it is wildlife rich so so yeah great north forest it's going ahead um, i mean it's, it's probably a good thing but i'm not sure that it's the way i would have done it thanks um so i think you touched on this question previously when you were talking about um subsidies in the cap um so rachel's saying i think this government has reduced subsidies to farmers is this going to hurt wildlife? Should we be shouting about this now? No, what the, if, if, if they go ahead with what they say they're going ahead with, um, and after the brief hiccup of the trust government, they seem to be now going ahead with it again. Um, but, you know, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. But um, if they do go do it, then farmers will be rewarded for public good. So they will get the subsidies but they will be for things like uh, improving wildlife on their uh, biodiversity on their farms, uh, improving carbon capture, and uh, improving soil quality and things like that. What they won't get it for, which is what they get at the moment, is I've got 200 hectares, therefore give me N thousand pounds, uh, which is what's been happening up to now, which is a mad system. I mean, it just benefits the, the larger the landowner, the more money they get. Um, yeah. So, so the, the subsidies are still there. For the time being okay and i've spotted um a, a whole pile more questions in the q a i think it wasn't working for a while so um we're we're moving to the q a for a few minutes um so does the yorkshire wildlife trust help landowners with rewilding private land yep we do and we have a couple of uh quite large-scale landowners who we're working with at the moment uh, and that's hugely important it's a really exciting prospect because as i said before you can only really do uh rewilding at scale um you know once you go down to small areas rewilding usually results in loss of biodiversity rather than gain so uh, i mean the most famous example in britain at the moment is the nep estate in sussex which was converted from a traditional agricultural estate in which was apparently loss making into a rewilded area um, where they get they now make money but they make money out of things like holiday cottages safaris and so on but it, it, it in terms of wildlife it has worked brilliantly it's the best place in the country to go to see purple emperor butterflies to listen to nightingales singing they've got storks breeding there now with a bit of help but the first breeding storks in in britain since the is it the 14th century the last one was in st giles's cathedral in edinburgh for some obscure reason um so you know th th it has worked brilliantly in that sense how replicatable that model is across the country is a, a matter of debate but there are certainly huge opportunities and many large estates um are are prime candidates for rewilding um and there are several in yorkshire which are going down that road at the moment so yes yes we do um and but it's only one of the things that is going to be beneficial and in truth rewilding ideally works at even bigger scale than that because even at that scale you still have to intervene 
So at NEP, they have uh, Tamworth pigs and so on, which are playing the role of, of wild boar, which you would have in a genuinely wilder area. Um, and those, those pigs are culled and they, they, they get pork from them and they sell it as a very high end product. Um, so if you want to do proper rewilding, you need really big areas. Um, so there's a, a question from Charlie who's asking what sort of habitats or ecology would constitute effective corridors between reserves? For example, in the case of Askenbog, what could reasonably be done to connect this to other habitats nearby? Well, Askham is a sort of bee in my bonnet, and, and it's a it's in a tiny little catchment. And in my view, the sensible thing would be put the whole catchment into conservation management. But uh, you know that's difficult because uh, um, you know it, it involves the interests of landowners. I mean, quite a few of the landowners there uh, were were hoping to build houses on the land. Um, so the ideal would be uh, to sort of that. We we know what sort of habitats were there. Uh, 100 years ago, because we have the plant records which tell us what sort of habitats we've lost. So it is possible to imagine how you'd restore it. Um, very often, the critical thing turns out to be making land wetter. We've had a, a, a policy over the last several hundred years of trying to get water off the land as fast as possible and to lower water tables. And that was because it was felt that that was the only way to sustain um, uh, the high yields agriculturally and to, and to actually convert land from wetland to agricultural land. And the, if we look at the, I mean, for example, if you look at the plant, the plants that have gone extinct in Yorkshire in the last 150 years, there's 40 odd of them, exactly half of them were wetland plants. So what we've lost has mainly been wetland species. So the, the drainage of wetlands has been hugely damaging. So if I was going to say one thing that we could do, which would improve uh, the, the, the broader landscape, it would be to reduce the drainage in places where it doesn't matter. And that means effectively reconnecting rivers with their floodplains wherever you possibly can. And that would bring huge benefits for people who live in towns downstream. They would be much less likely to find their houses underwater. And for quite understandable reasons, people rather object to finding their houses underwater. So it's, it's a win-win. Um, there's an extension to um, Charlie's question there, which is about how habitats could be connected across the huge barriers of the A19, A64, M1, um, and the role of animal bridges and tunnels. So would you yeah. like to... There's several European countries now have animal bridges, and they are brilliant things and I have no idea why we refuse to have them in this country I mean basically when a road is a new road is constructed uh, it's done to the minimum possible specification they can get away with uh, and, and a, an animal bridge is just an extra cost that they don't want to have um, but they very often have bridges for farm tracks they have to uh, so in some cases even sometimes for bridleways uh, there are bridges and those could easily be converted by being made a little bit wider and not being maintained in the same way. Those could be easily converted to animal uh, pathways. So it is perfectly doable. I was pretty horrified when I saw the plans for the dueling of the Northern Ring Road around York. Um, that I mean, for a start, the provision for cycling is extremely negative. So if cyclists can't get across it, then the chance of wildlife getting across it are extremely small. I discovered. Uh, this is what I was told by I was told by one councillor um, that the money they received for it explicitly excluded that sort of thing. And then I was told by another councillor that it was because the original bid didn't include anything for that sort of thing because they weren't so they weren't allowed to do that sort of thing. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure it didn't because nobody thinks of those things, but it would be a relatively minor additional cost when building these massive roads. Uh, to to allow uh, movement of wildlife, it's not not a big thing, and it, we we should do it if we're serious. Um, yeah, th thanks for for that um, response. We've we've got a few now on um, farming, a few suggestions, and I'm aware we're kind of reaching our last four minutes, um, so I'm not sure um, if we'll have time to to respond to all of them. 
but the first one is about you mentioned the the need for areas outside national parks to be helped not just protected lands um we have areas of outstanding natural beauty could we have areas of outstanding natural farming too um in the non-protected lands i think that's a fascinating idea i haven't, I haven't heard that one before um i thought that's a really a really nice one i mean is the, I, but it's going to happen if enough farmers in the same area decide to go down that road. I went to a really inspiring seminar recently given by a farmer from Cambridgeshire who'd inherited a loss making farm. He didn't rewild it, but he renatured it, as it were, and is now making a profit. And they're making a profit because his inputs have gone down dramatically. He's no longer doing so much plowing. So fuel costs have gone down. Equipment costs have gone down. He's no longer using herbicides and insecticides. So those costs have gone shooting down. He's using far less fertilizers because the natural fertility of the soil is being restored. And if, if we can get there um, with more farmers recognizing that is the way forward, uh, then uh, I think the answer is we will fight. We'll see that happening. I, th I think it is actually in our grasp, but it requires government to do what it says it's going to do. I think there are a lot of farmers who will go down that road. They prefer to do that if they were if if it was economically feasible for them to do so. And I see and that links precisely to a question I can see there. Decent farm. This is from Sarah. Decent farms I know are starting to be concerned about food security. Do you see any tension between land for food and enhancing nature? And if so, how do we resolve this? And I don't think that there is, no. I mean, I think um, we can still get uh, high levels of food production on some of our land. And actually, uh, you don't lose a huge amount of production by farming in a less intensive way. You lose some, uh, but it's pretty marginal and your costs go down dramatically. And it's quite clear that you can get good yields out of land if you look after it better. Uh, and there's lots of farmers doing that now. Um, it looks like the, the quiz, quiz question is where, where we're going to end for the moment. Um, when were oysters last seen in the Humber? God, I think they're still there. I think they're yeah. just in tiny quantities. There used to be huge beds of them. I think I'm right in saying that they never actually disappeared and they're now being put back in. Um, but so I think I think that's right. But I would I, I confess I'm not a, an oyster expert. And so I'd have to go and check. Thanks very much, Alistair. Um, could I just ask you if there, there were one or two things that you would, because there's obviously massive amount of interest in this, um, if there were one or two things that you would suggest each of us go away and, and do, what, what would those things be? Join the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, volunteer with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, <laughs> and tell all your friends and neighbours to do the same. Uh, and actually get engaged, I mean, you know, you probably are already, but if you're already engaged with wildlife, do so more. I mean, this is going to, we're going to succeed in this quest if people are are keen and enthusiastic, if they really want it to happen. It's not going to happen just because a few people say it ought to happen. It's going to happen because there is a general, genuine public movement which says it's got to happen. If, if people not only do things, but make it plain to their MP. So when, you know, when uh, your local internal drainage board trashes your local river, write to your MP and tell them what you think about it and let them know. Uh, MPs are very sensitive to that sort of pressure. Uh, tell your local councillor, tell your local councillors what you think about the York Ring Road. You know, it, they, they worry about this. What they mostly hear is the loud voices and the loud voices tend to be the ones we don't want to hear. So they need to hear your voices too. So do it and say it, I think, is what I'd say. And on those powerful last words, I think we'll call the meeting to a close. Um, thank you so much again, Alistair, and thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, yeah, much appreciated and hope to see you at a future One Planet Week or Yorkshire Wildlife Trust event. Thank you.